Hello Interwebs, welcome to Let's Fix Computers. I've got a Dell Latitude E series here. This is an E6440 and it's got the classic case of the charger light goes out when you plug it in. So watch the green light on the charger, it's on and it goes out. Let's get into it everyone. So, uh, charger light goes out when you plug it in, classic sign that there is a short circuit in the laptop somewhere. We've seen this quite a few times on this channel with Dell laptops, very, very common failure mode. Uh, the nice thing is, is that charger light going out, it's a really nice broadcast of what to expect when you open up the laptop. We know that there is most likely going to be a short circuit on the main power rail with this. So I'm going to go ahead and start taking this apart. And as soon as we've got access to somewhere useful, uh, we can start taking some measurements. So I'll just take these covers off until I can see something useful and we'll stick on the multimeter. How the fresh hell do you open this thing? Oh, it's, it's not a slider, it's a lifter. Okay. Okay, uh, we've got the back of the DC jack where it plugs into the motherboard here. I'm just going to quickly take a reading from that. However, I'm fairly certain this won't be where the short is. However, black probe on the black pins, red probe on the red pins. And we've got 70 odd kilo ohms of resistance there. No problem at all. It almost uh, It's very rarely the DC jack these days. It's always worth a look. Uh, let's keep digging. This is a three-piece design, so we've got the bottom cover has come off. Now we need to remove the top cover, which leaves us with this mid-chassis. They're quite laborious to take apart, these latitudes, so um, I'm going to keep digging. Okay, I've been following the uh, I've been following the just take out every screw in sight strategy, which is generally overkill, and I've probably taken out a whole bunch of screws that I didn't need to. But when you're in a hurry like I am, and you just want to get the job done, it's usually faster just to strip out every screw you see rather than sit down and systematically understand which one is which. Be quiet. Um, so at any rate, we've got the top case off now, um, and uh, I think from here we're going to be able to get the motherboard out. I'm hoping we can do that without removing the display assembly, although that much being said, I think we only have two or three screws holding the display assembly in now, so we're at the point where it might be worth doing that anyway. But I'm just going to see if I can get this out. I've got a few screws to go, and then we'll lift this out. It's going to unhook from the back, and I've got to pry it out from this daughter board up in the top left. And then I think we're there. Come on, out you come. Come out, come out, come out. Ah, front speakers, my nemesis. There we go. Ah. Ah. 8 gigabyte memory kit. I'm going to pop out that CPU as well, I think. Because I can. The fact that the CPU is socketed kind of shows that this laptop is getting on a bit. But um, these, are, 
these latitudes are workhorses and they go on forever. Uh, some people like ThinkPads, some people like latitudes. I'm a latitude fanboy. Um, however, I've said before, I'm under no illusion. They're horrible to take apart. I'm going to peel back this uh, um, this protective cover just so we can see the back of the board. All right, let's see. So time for a visual inspection, looking for anything that's obviously exploded. Um, so with plastic covers like this, if anything on the back had gone nuclear, it it would leave a big old burn mark on this plastic cover. So I'm fairly certain that there's nothing to see back here, but. I'm doing just a, a very brief inspection anyway, just as a sanity check. But I don't think that's the case. All right, so our DC comes in over here, and this is where we're going to find the main power rail. So I'm going to switch over to the microscope, and we're going to follow the money, and we're going to follow the power and see where it goes. So here's the DC jack as it plugs into the board, and you can see we've got a sense pin, two grounds, and two powers. Um, so the grounds, they just go straight to ground, no surprises. The powers, they go onto this trace here. You can see there's a big fat trace coming off of that. And that comes along here, and it goes into this inductor here. So this is a, this is a inductor, and that just smooths out transients caused by connecting and disconnecting the, um, the charger. So when you plug it in and there's that initial jolt as there's a bad connection as the two things join together, this guy just smooths that out. Uh, so then that moves up to here. And here we have our inrush limiter. Uh, so we've got a set of two MOSFETs. And we've got some bypass capacitors there. So we're going to go into this MOSFET package. And then we're going to go out of there and into this one. And the output from this one becomes our main power rail. And then if we go over a little bit further, you can see there is our current sense resistor, which then monitors how much power is going into the laptop. So let's do some measurements. We already know, based on our measurement of the DC jack, that the main input here is not shorted. So we'll just verify that now. So black probe is on ground, red probe on there, and we should see about 70 kilo ohms, which we do. Sorry the display isn't very clear on the multimeter, by the way. I do have plans to replace this with something better, but I'm still figuring it out Figuring out what. So let's go to the other side of the um, inrush limiter now. So we'll take the output from here, and let's check that guy. And hey-ho, we have 0.3 ohms. So that is fundamentally a dead short circuit. So remember, with short circuits, we're not in continuity mode, we're in resistance mode. We're not looking for a beep, we're looking for less than one ohm, dead, fundamentally dead zero, which is what we've got here. That points something, that's just losses in the leads and my connection. So we found a short circuit. Um, so that is why the laptop does not turn on. So what I'm going to do now is we can follow through. We go through the current sense resistor. That guy looks a little bit weird, if I'm honest. But, I mean, this guy won't be at fault, but it almost looks... Yeah, that looks all right. Whatever. So once we go through the current sense resistor, you can see we go into this block of vias here. So that's VIA, and it's a path that goes through the motherboard. It goes via the circuit board. So let's flip the board over to the other side. And there's the other side of those vias. Now, you can see that this doesn't go anywhere. So what this tells me is that we've gone into an internal power plane. So we're now on an internal layer of the circuit board that we can't see. So where do we go from here? Well, we don't need to know where this goes because we know where it's going to come up it has to appear at any secondary power supply. So over here, we've got our CPU vCore um, circuit. So this is the power supply into the CPU. And you can tell because we've got MOSFETs, inductors, and a massive power trace going up to the CPU socket, or the CPU if there would be one fitted. Um, so uh, this is all going to be powered from that main power rail. So if we measure the input over here, 
we're going to find that this is all shorted as well. Now, two of these will be the high sides and two of these will be the low sides. I'm not sure which will be which, and we can't actually tell because the whole lot is going to be shorted to ground. So if we measure one side of this capacitor, we've got zero ohms. And if we check the other side of the capacitor, oh, that's interesting. Okay, we've got mega ohms there. What about over here? Same. Interesting. V core input is not shorted. So this is a ground plane, and these are the low sides. And these are the high sides because they have high resistance on their inputs. These should be connected to um, the main power rail, but apparently they're not. I'm going to flip the board over and see what's on the other side there. So on the other side, you can see all of that via stitching for that ground plane. And if I just check these guys, we should find that this side is ground because that's the ground plane. There we go, there's ground again. And these sides are not shorted. Okay. So on this side here, that's our power trace then. So that's coming into there and it goes through the board again. And that's coming in from there. So this is input capacitance for CPU V core. And these guys aren't shorted, huh? This should be the main power rail. There must be a secondary power supply between the main power rail and CPU V core. Uh, now, I know that modern Dells do this, but I didn't think old Dells did. However, I guess I'm wrong. So, um, let's see. Well, where do we go from here then? Well, I think what I might do in that case is cheat. I might just go straight to voltage injection. What I wanted to do was better demonstrate how we can measure where this rail comes up and where it's going to. But... The it seems to go to a secondary supply that then powers the rest of the board. This is kind of similar to how a MacBook works. In a MacBook, you have the uh, charger input, which then goes to PP bus G3 hot, which then in turn powers everything else. Normally on a Dell like this, you just have charger input that just runs a 19 volt supply all over the board. But that doesn't seem to be the case here. Um, I could look up schematics and we could discover this, but sometimes looking and discovering is more fun. It's also good practice for when you don't have schematics available. Okay, well, the other thing that we need to know before we start injecting power is we need to look for any other things that could be shorted that we don't want to inject. So um, let's make sure, for example, that uh, our CPU supply is not actually shorted, which we already know it won't be, but I'll check it again for good measure. So the CPU coils here, we should find that those are not shorted. And they're not. We have lots of resistance there. So that's um, that's capacitors charging lots of ohms, lots of kilo ohms. So there's no short circuit. Um, if we found uh, on, a on a more modern motherboard with the CPU fitted, we'd see things there. In fact, I can just fit the CPU and demonstrate this. If I drop the CPU back in there, now there's a CPU in the socket, we're going to find low resistance. Not a short, low resistance. So back onto that coil again. So now it's at 48 ohms instead of being at like 50,000 ohms. Now this is considerably higher than a modern CPU. On a modern CPU, I would expect to see about 3 or 4 ohms. Now, three or four ohms is low enough that your, that your multimeter would beep in continuity mode, which makes people think that their CPU is shorted to ground. But it's not. It's just low resistance. However, you can see that we don't have zero ohms on the CPU. So this tells me that our V-core phases are not shorted. Now, I would also want to do the same tests on GPU V-core if we had a GPU on this board. However, we don't, we only have a CPU. This guy here, in case you're wondering, is the PCH, uh, which is the 
uh, platform controller host, I think. Someone else will correct me on that. But it's essentially, fundamentally, it's the chipset of the motherboard. Um, and uh, this guy, um, this is also something we would want to watch out for. But with a short circuit on the main power rail, I wouldn't expect to see problems here. So we're going to leave this guy alone. Okay, so, well, that, that being the case, this is kind of a non-standard approach because it's an older board and it has some weird bits about it that I'm not expecting. So rather than trying to, um, rather than trying to do a deep dive into figuring this board out blind, I'm moving straight to injection. Um, now, for a comprehensive discussion about power injection to find short circuits, I'm working on a video that covers the ins and outs of it that um, I will consider to be a must watch for anyone who is looking to learn board repair. Um, however, we're going to crack on for now because uh, I'm doing the. I'm inter I'm more interested in repairing this laptop. I'm here to get this thing running again. So let's advance. What I'm going to do now is we have a short circuit on the main power input here. So I'm going to inject power onto that rail and see what gets hot. So I'm going to solder two jumper wires, one of them to ground and one of them to our shorted rail. And then I'm going to inject one volt and three amps onto that. And I'm going to use my thermal camera to see what gets hot. So I'm going to set up for that and I'll see you guys when we're ready to turn on the power supply. Right, we're all set to go, so I've got my bench power supply set up. I'm starting at 2 amps because when I'm using a uh, thermal camera, you don't need a lot of power to detect it with a thermal camera. If you're using other methods like um, the touchy-feely method, just fingertips or alcohol, you're probably going to need more power. However, we are now blessed with the modern technology, so I'm going to turn on the power and let's see what gets hot. Right, so notice that we've sunk down. Well, we're actually running a volt. That's um, not so good. I would like to be a bit lower than that. We are at two amps though. Nothing heating up there. My wires are getting hotter because they're not very thick wires. I don't think my jumper wires are thick enough. In fact, I've got major doubts that these wires are actually doing the job. That might be my problem. I'm going to try giving it 3 amps. Just in uh, It's not going to give me 3 amps because we're locked off at 1 volt. Okay, I think my connection is bad. Right, we're all hooked up with some beefier uh, jumper cables now. Power on. There we go, that's better. Now we've just immediately dived down to 0.38 volts. So because we're in a short circuit, the volts have to go down, and we're now capped off at 2 amps. This is good because it means that I can increase the amps later on, and also our jumper wires are no longer heating up, which is also good. And it looks like we've got a hot spot there. And there's a bunch of capacitors there, so that definitely looks promising. Is there anything on the other side of the board? There is some residual there, but not as much as on the top. And again, this is the side with the plastic on, so I'm not expecting it to be on that side, because there was no marks on the plastic. All right, I think that needs more amps. Let's give it some more. That's three amps, and we're up to 0.57 volts now. And yeah, there we go. We're starting to light up there now. So... Due to the accuracy of my thermal camera, it's um, you can see from the heat map of my hand that this thermal camera is not very accurate at close range, which is very annoying. Um, but it's definitely one of those caps. I'm guessing it's the far left one. Um, so let's switch the power off and inspect those. So there are the four caps that we were just looking at, and I suspected that it was the far right one, this guy, who was actually heating up. Um, none of them look in great condition. If we go to a slight angle, 
If we go to an angle, you can see that the far left one has got lines on it. It almost looks like it's cracked. And the second one, that looks okay. And then the third and fourth ones, they kind of look bubbles. They look like they've been baking. They haven't like spewed their guts or anything, but they none of those look in great condition. So what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to take all four of them off the board and we'll take a look at them and see what state they're in and what value they are. And then we can see where we stand. So I'm going to get the hot air warmed up and we'll take those off the board. So, first of all, have we found our short circuit? I'm going to probe the points where I was injecting again. So, ground point and that main power rail. And we're no longer shorted to ground. So, we have found the short circuit. Now, it's a question of which one it is. So, let's take a closer look at those caps. All right. Contestant number one. This is the guy with the lines in it that almost looked like it was fractured. That is open line. Now, I've, if I didn't know better, I would say that's blown open. There should be some resistance there. I think this one is dead, but it's, it's failed open, which is unusual for a capacitor, but, you know, it can happen. So, fine, we'll stick him to one side. Contestant number two. Ha, huh. okay. Also open line. I mean, these might just be fully charged. Oops. That one is now gone because I slipped off of it and it was ejected into the void. We'll never know. Contestant number two is missing in action, everyone. Contestant number three. Will you fare any better? This is one of our bubbly boys. That is dead short. That's our guy. So that is our short circuit. That's kill. So that's our culprit. Put you to one side in the naughty capacitor department. And contestant number four. What say you? And that is also reading open line. So again, I would expect to see initially low resistance and then a rising resistance on these. So that doesn't mean they failed, though. We found one failed capacitor. So we found our culprit. We win. So let's try doing um, a capacitance measurement on these to see if we can determine what they are. So I've, slipped, I've switched the multimeter into capacitance mode. And let's see what these, these two remaining guys read. It's a 22 microfarad. Love to see it. Overplayed. They're everywhere these days. And you... are also 22 microfarad. So this is a bank of four 22 microfarad capacitors. Um, so... Um, I am... Going to replace all of them, I think. I've got plenty of these guys, so I'm not going to mess about. I'm going to replace all of them um, because they all looked to be in sketchy condition. So we're just going to change them all out. So, all right, let's get some new ones on the board. Right, so I'm going to touch up these pads with some leaded solder and then we're going to hot air these replacement capacitors into place because it's a little bit tight in there to get the iron in. Certainly doable, but it would be easier with hot air. So let's just get in there and just flow some more solder over all of those pads. I don't need to be very tidy with this. I just need blobs of solder, basically. I do need to be slightly tidier than that. 
Now I'm going to need some flux as well. You see how that top bit is just going bleh everywhere. That's because there's no flux. And this is what the flux does, is it stops the solder from going bleh. Also though, that's a heckin' big ground plane we're on, which is not helping things. I can feel that under the iron. There we go, that's slightly better. This is the reason why when I was injecting power, we weren't seeing much heat develop. This actually would have been quite difficult to find without a thermal camera. We would have needed a lot of power going into that um, because uh, this section here on the right is a ground plane and it's just sucking all the heat out of everything. Um, and that's probably why as well there wasn't just any real visual indicators for this because the capacitors were short but they were also effectively sitting on top of a heat sink. Right, here comes the hot air and we've taken the airflow right down because we're putting stuff back on the board and we don't want to blow it away. I'm just going to line these guys up, get them all vaguely into position. Oh, I should have started from the top. Once the start solder starts flowing, it'll get easier. There you go. See the solder started flowing and they all just magnetized into place. I love it when that happens. Can you go straight, please? Beautiful. Oh, that's the dream. That's the dream. Not like that wretched Chromebook I was doing the other day when this when the capacitors just did not want to go on. Oh, you'd never know I'd been there. Perfect. Okay, now we're reassembling. So this is going to be really boring, so I'm not going to commentate on it. Let's get it done. Just for posterity as well, this section we were working on, this was the main power rail power supply that I was looking for or talking about earlier on. We had a short circuit on this side here, and we go through this MOSFET, through this inductor, then there's a current resistor there, and then this power rail here then connects to everywhere else in the board, including CPU vCore. So this is why we did not see the short circuit at vCore input, because that is all behind this MOSFET, and the short circuit was in front of the MOSFET. So that was essentially acting as a block between the shorted section and the not shorted section. Um, so... As I say, I didn't think old Dell uh, laptops did this design, but clearly they do. Um, however, yeah, some laptops like Dell's, you will see they'll have a 19 volt power rail and then they'll have a secondary power supply, probably going down to an arbitrary value like 12 volts that goes to the rest of the um, motherboard. We could look up the value, but it doesn't really matter. The point is there was another power supply there. laptop has switched on the moment I plug the battery in. It's power cycling, so it's probably RAM training. We are now on charge. 
Oh, well, the charge light came on for a moment. Let me just make sure that the charger hasn't fallen over. Nope, oh, charger light is still on as well. It's going to make me nervous. I put in a lot of screws without testing this, and I'm now suddenly very aware of that. I mean, it must work because it's powering on. Everything else is just post issues. It has not posted because the caps lock key doesn't work, or at least that's a good indicator that it's not posted. I'm going to turn it off and on again. I might just pull the SSD out and reseat the RAM. No need to panic quite yet. Whatever has happened, it probably does not facilitate stripping the laptop down again. If it does, I'm going to be livid. <laughs> oh, that didn't feel like it was plugged in properly. Also, let this be a lesson to you guys to uh, test before you put all the screws in. The only reason why I didn't is because I forgot. Right, CMOS battery is connected. That is on properly. I'm just going to pop the RAM out and just put it back in again for good measure. These memory modules didn't go in very nicely. They didn't feel very satisfying, so lots of things that this could be still. Also, while I'm here, the CMOS battery voltage is oh one volt well there's your problem okay our bias battery is also kill uh cool all right i'm going to finish doing this i'm going to uh start it up again and we'll probably find it does not post then i'll swap this guy out and then we'll see if it posts, and then we can go, there we go, it was the BIOS battery. Okay, right, plug in. It's switched on by itself again. And it's off. And it's on. Another power cycle. This looks more like RAM training now. No one likes having to buy these ones, but make sure you got them. All right, no change. Make sure that these are the correct polarity. They are. The wire is much too long, but that's fine. It's power cycling again. I'd expect it to need three, maybe four power cycles before it actually posts. So I'm giving it, I'm probably cutting out time gaps in editing because otherwise it's just a lot of sitting with nothing happening. But I'm giving it like a good 30 seconds a minute for each of these attempts. Okay, I've turned it off and I'm turning it on again. Because it's not power cycling on its own. There we go. All right. Invalid configuration information, that's fine. The we win screen. Good. So if it hadn't posted then, my next thoughts would have been that the BIOS was scrambled. Um, maybe bit rot or something like that. I don't know. Um, like the, the BIOS battery had gone really low there. That might be to do with the shorted rail in there. Um, uh, because there was a short circuit in the laptop, it's possible that just everything was, was eating power. Also, though, just based on the age of the laptop, it's entirely possible that this is probably just died of old age because it's a 10-year-old laptop. Um 
it, if I'd given it a couple more tries, it might have started with this guy in it. Um, but we would have been seeing issues with it not keeping day and time and stuff like that. This guy is indisputably flat, no questions there. Okay, well, very straightforward fault from the outset. Charger cuts out. We found um, a bad capacitor at uh, the main power rail power supply where it converts charger voltage down to a probably 12 volts. I never bothered checking it, doesn't matter. Uh, but we replaced that dead capacitor. We replaced the other ones near it as well because they all looked a bit ropey. Um, and then we had some funky post issues which I think were down to just a bad um, BIOS battery. Anyway, thank you everyone for tuning in. I'll see you next time. Bye for now.